Iapetus is the third largest moon of Saturn and the eleventh largest in the solar system. As a moon specifically, it is technically above average in size, but when compared to other spherical moons in the solar system, it is below average. It has a diameter of 1,470 kilometers, meaning the moon has a diameter that is 2.3 times longer. The total surface area of it is 6,770,000 kilometers square, which is a bit less than the surface area of Australia. We first got to see how Iapetus looks like really up close in the 2000s, when the Cassini probe imaged it, around 330 years after its discovery. Before that, it just appeared as a dimly lit dot that varied in brightness over the course of its orbit around Saturn because of its highly contrasting sides. Its distance from the Sun is between 1.35 and 1.5 billion kilometers. There is that difference of about 150 million kilometers when it is at its closest and at its farthest because it orbits Saturn and Saturn has an elongated orbit around the Sun. Now when we look at the orbit of Iapetus around Saturn, immediately it is pretty clear that its orbit is different compared to the rest of the major moons of Saturn. It is significantly more inclined. Now these significantly inclined orbits are usually not found with spherical moons that orbit planets. The other example of a very inclined orbit is that of Triton around Neptune, but it also has a retrograde orbit, meaning it rotates in the opposite direction that Neptune does. Now that is a rare thing for a spherical moon, but it also means that the moon was very likely captured by Neptune's gravity after both objects were formed in the regions that are very far apart from each other and then Triton was ejected from its region at some point in the past. Considering that Triton has a very similar composition to Pluto, it likely formed in the region that Pluto is currently in, that is the Kuiper Belt. Otherwise, if Neptune or Triton were formed in the same region, it wouldn't have a retrograde orbit. So the capturing of Triton by Neptune scenario explains its extremely inclined orbit, retrograde orbit, and why Triton is similar in composition to Pluto. But the weird thing is that Iapetus doesn't have a retrograde orbit, but it is still very significantly inclined. So then the explanation for why Iapetus has a very inclined orbit very likely isn't that it is because it was captured by Saturn after it formed a new region very far away. Very likely something else happened here that made its orbit so inclined. And we don't have a really good explanation as to why that is the case, which is just one current mystery of Iapetus. Iapetus is also tidally locked, like most spherical moons. It needs 79 days to rotate around its axis and to complete a full orbit around Saturn, which means that while viewing Saturn from Iapetus' surface, it would stay on one side of Iapetus, but because its orbit is inclined, it would still move slightly on one side of Iapetus back and forth. Now usually most spherical moons are tidally locked, but they also don't have inclined orbits. So that causes, for example, while viewing Saturn from Rhea, another moon of Saturn, for Saturn to stay almost completely fixated in the sky, which is because Rhea doesn't have a significantly inclined orbit, and that would also cause the rings of Saturn, which also orbit around the equatorial plane, to appear as just a line from its surface, as it also would from every other major spherical moon of Saturn, as their orbits are all not significantly inclined. But from Iapetus, the thick ring system could be observed, as then from certain positions, you would be viewing Saturn's rings from a different angle. Although Saturn itself would appear to be smaller compared to how it would appear from any other major spherical moon of Saturn. Still, despite the fact that Iapetus orbits Saturn at a distance of 3.6 million kilometers, which is around 10 times more than the distance between the Earth and the Moon, it would still appear about 4 times larger compared to how the Moon appears from Earth. So that also means that it would appear about as big as Earth does from the Moon, which is simply because Saturn is huge. Inside the volume of Saturn could fit around 760 Earths, or around 37,000 moons of Earth. Anyways, now let's look at the features of Iapetus and see what it would it be like to see them from the surface. One feature that stands out a lot, even while observing Iapetus from hundreds or thousands of kilometers away, is the equatorial ridge that it has. It is so visible from such a great distance because it goes around for about two-thirds of the equator and is very tall. The ridge is about twice as long as the diameter of Iapetus. It spans for roughly 3,000 kilometers. This is how long it would look like if it were on Earth. It could stretch from a very western part of France all the way to a very eastern part of Ukraine. If you were standing in, let's say, an adequate spacesuit near this region, you would also notice that not only is it very long, as you would see it stretch way beyond the horizon, but it is also very tall. Generally, it is about 10 kilometers above the surrounding plains. Now, imagine standing there and seeing something that is that long, 
and about 20 times the height of One World Trade Center, one of the tallest buildings in the world. And there are even peaks on this ridge that go up to 20 kilometers above the surrounding plains. Seeing such a peak would be seeing something that goes 40 times more up in the sky than One World Trade Center. That is why this ridge mountain at its highest points is one of the tallest in the solar system. It is by far taller than any mountain on Earth and almost as tall as Olympus Mons, the tallest planetary mountain in the solar system. Now if you were on the top of this ridge in the part where it is 20 kilometers tall, you would get to see not just how long and tall the ridge is, but wide as well. It is about 20 kilometers wide on average, about as wide as the tallest peaks are high. Since this huge ridge is located in the Cassini region, which is the dark part of Iapetus, while looking into the distance, you would see a dark brownish and reddish terrain that is heavily cratered, but especially in the dark region, it would be very dimly lit. Because not only does the dark surface absorb a lot of light, but Iapetus is around 1.5 billion kilometers away from the Sun, which is around 10 times more than the distance between the Earth and the Sun. So Iapetus is receiving about a hundred times less sunlight compared to Earth. Now, you would also see impact craters all over the ridge as well. And of course, since you would be viewing the ridge from so up close, you would be able to see all the complexities in much greater detail compared to what is currently captured. Also, this high impact crater density indicates that the surface and the ridge itself, because it is also heavily cratered, is ancient. But one really stunning part is that while being that much above the surrounding plains, around 20 kilometers, you would also be able to see the curvature of Iapetus. Although it wouldn't be extremely pronounced, it would definitely be noticeable, which is simply because Iapetus is so small compared to how tall the ridge is. The top of the ridge you are on is insanely high up in the sky. Now what is also interesting about this ridge, besides the sheer size of it, is that it is going along the equator of Iapetus almost perfectly. And we currently don't have the exact reason for as to why that is the case, which is another current mystery of Iapetus. Although there are quite a few explanations that explain how it formed, obviously the explanations are not certainly true, and they all share a bit of a problem. One explanation says that the ridge formed when Iapetus was very young and was rotating many times faster than it does now. If it was heated enough, which could have caused it to be more plastic, all of those factors could have made the material on the equator to be propped up. Another explanation says that Iapetus far in the past could have had a ring system, which is possible considering the huge area that it gravitationally dominates. It is orbiting Saturn at a distance of 3.6 million kilometers, three times farther away than Titan orbits Saturn. This huge gap between the two farthest spherical moons can only be seen on Saturn in the solar system. But that distance also technically allows Iapetus to have a fairly big ring system itself. And if it did have one far in the past, when the relatively small material from the ring system eventually fell towards Iapetus as the ring system collapsed, it would have accumulated around the equator, because ring material is always going around the equatorial plane of the object it is orbiting. That is even occurring with the ring system of Saturn, and Saturn is consistently getting showered on the equator by the materials from the ring. But it is not building up and creating a ridge because it simply does not have a solid surface. Two small, non-spherical moons, Atlas and Pan, that are orbiting Saturn close along the ring system have even accumulated material from the ring system and now they have a ridge around them. This proves that it is possible to build up ridges by sweeping up the material from a ring system. Although in the case of these two small moons, they certainly got that from Saturn's rings. While with Iapetus, it is still unclear. Now the problem is that there isn't an explanation for why the ridge only appears in the Cassini region, the dark region. With every explanation currently for how or why the ridge formed, it would also follow that a ridge would be formed as well on the bright side of Iapetus. But that isn't the case. For some reason, the ridge is cut off right where the whiteness truly starts to completely dominate the region. Now we can see that there is a part right where the ridge is cut off in the Cassini area and is no longer there. But that is almost certainly because of a giant impact crater, Turgis. Meaning that when a celestial body impacted this area, it also destroyed the ridge. And we can see that the ridge reappears again on the equator at the edge of the Cassini region, around where the impact crater isn't there. It is highly likely that at some point in the past, before some celestial body hit that part, there was a ridge there. But for some reason, the fully white side doesn't have a ridge. You can notice what the spacing out is between the major ridge formations on the dark side. But suddenly, on the fully white side, there is a huge area lacking in this ridge formation. The only other area that is odd in this regard on the dark region is explained by the impact crater, but for the fully white side, there isn't a clear clue. 
Maybe the properties of that white region made it so that the bridge disappeared or never formed in the first place. Overall, that is still unknown. Now the bright side of Iapetus is divided in two large landmasses, Saragossa Terra and Runcavox Terra. Basically, the southern region is Saragossa and the northern one is Runcavox. And they are clearly very different looking compared to the Cassini region. The high contrast present on the surface is another current mystery of Iapetus. One theory states that it is present because one side of Iapetus gathered some sort of material from another celestial body, possibly from other moons present around Saturn. Saturn overall has 82 moons. However, the material got there in the first place is still unknown. Now the thing is that because of the 79 day long day-night cycle, that also causes one side of the moon to be exposed to sunlight for a bit more than a month. And as a result, the dark material that was gathered on one side of Iapetus would absorb a lot of sunlight, enough for that side of Iapetus to be warmed up so that the icy material sublimes over some period of time, which would cause the surface to become very dark on that side, while the other one, the white side, wouldn't experience the same process, as there isn't enough of the dark material to absorb the sunlight and warm up enough for that to cause the sublimation of ice around it. Now, while moving about around Iapetus in your adequate spacesuit, you would almost certainly notice as to how insanely light you would feel. That is because its gravity is about 44 times weaker than the gravity of Earth. So you would feel about 44 times lighter than you do on Earth, unless your spacesuit is for some reason 43 times heavier than your body weight. Then you would feel about as heavy as you do on Earth. But if it's not, and its weight is insignificant, and you are about the average weight for a human on Earth, then on Iapetus you would be about as heavy as a pineapple on Earth that would also allow you to jump much higher than you can on Earth. Now, such a low gravity is to be expected. Generally, the smaller the object is, the less is its gravitational strength, as it is less massive. But the gravity of Iapetus is even low compared to some other moons in the solar system that have almost the same diameter. Two such moons are Titania and Oberon. They are orbiting Uranus. Both of the objects have about 1.6 times stronger surface gravity compared to Iapetus. And then we also have Rhea, a moon of Saturn, which has the surface gravity that is similar to Iapetus. These different gravities are there because of different masses of the bodies. And that different mass is in about the same volume that allows us to know the density of each object and tells us roughly about the composition of the moons themselves. Because of that, we can then understand that Iapetus and Rhea are mostly composed of icy materials. About 80% of their composition is ice and the rest 20% is rock while the composition of Titania and Oberon is in equal parts ice and rock. Since there is more rock that is making up both of them in the same volume compared to Iapetus and Rhea, and rock is denser than ice, that also leads to their masses being greater compared to Iapetus and Rhea, which then leads them to having overall a stronger gravitational pull, despite being the same in size. Now while moving about in the white region, it would seem like a different moon compared to the dark region. It would be a lot more lit as the white surface is reflecting light a lot more compared to the dark surface. It would be very interesting to see the Angelier Crater up close. It is 500 kilometers in diameter. While standing near the edge of it, you would see huge walls that would go beyond the horizon. It wouldn't seem as if you are inside of a crater at all, since you would only be able to see a small side of the crater rim as it is so huge. That would also be the case if you were near the cliff at the top. This crater also obstructs the impact formation of another crater named Jaren. You can see how the impact formation is cut off right where Angelier begins. Another crater that would also be interesting to visit is the Turgis crater in the Cassini region, which was previously mentioned. It is slightly longer than Angelier at 580 kilometers in diameter. While standing near the edge of this huge crater rim cliff, you would get a great view of the heavily cratered floor of the depression and another smaller crater, Maloon, that is about a hundred kilometers in diameter. But as with Angelier, on the ground you wouldn't be able to observe the entirety of the Turgus formation. So that is what it would be like to be on Iapetus and experience it from so up close. There are some puzzling features that would look pretty interesting while viewed from its surface. As of right now, unfortunately there are no confirmed plans to observe Iapetus to a greater degree that new data that could be gathered by doing so would possibly allow us to solve some or all of the puzzling things about it. 